afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to our Wednesday midday service this holy week. Uh, it uh, is a different holy week again from last year. Uh, we're grateful that many of us are able to be here <clears throat> in the building, but we also want to extend our warm welcome to all those who are joining us online. And uh, we are gathered today to, as we continue on the journey that Jesus took in his final week, the journey towards the cross. Just a few uh, quick notices before the service begins. Uh, we have our Good Friday service at 11 o'clock, and there are still spaces available for that. That's a... Um, it's more of a reflective service. It's and just going to be an hour long, um, centered on on the cross, really, on um, on Jesus' crucifixion, and uh, reflecting on the call to us as his followers, as his disciples, to take up our cross and follow him. Um, and you're all warmly invited to that. If you uh, would like to come and you haven't already booked, please do um, do that on the website or give the office a call and they'll be able to uh, allocate you a ticket. Uh, and then finally for our Easter Sunday, just in case um, you haven't seen, we've got two in-person services, one at nine, which is a communion service, one at three, which is an open air service. It's going to be out in the car park where we will have uh, worship. We will sing uh, because the government has confirmed that we're allowed to sing outside as, as a congregation on the grounds of the church. So um, again, just in terms of managing capacity, there are tickets for those, totally free. Um, again, please see the website um, or speak to the church office. Um, the tickets, the ticket sales will be taken down tomorrow lunchtime um, just to give the office enough time before they, um, before they close for the Easter weekend just to make sure that they've um, allocated everyone a seat and things like that. So tomorrow lunchtime, Thursday, 12, uh, 12 noon, the tickets on the website will go down, um, but give the church office a call if you have any difficulty. Well, Wednesday of Holy Week is often a day where the church reflects upon the person of Judas. Wednesday, as uh, we read in the Gospels, is the day that Judas decided to betray Jesus. And for that reason, the church is often uh, focused in its readings and reflections on this, uh, in some ways, most uh, troublesome disciple, I think, for us. We find Judas a hard disciple to spend much time thinking about. Um, but I think it is an important story for us to get to grips with. Um, so we will, be, uh, we will be reflecting on the story in John's gospel of Judas betraying Jesus a little later. But as we uh, begin, let's take a moment of quiet to quieten our hearts, to remind ourselves of God's presence that is with us always. So grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We pray together. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. Christ himself carried up our sins in his body to the cross so that free from sin, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. So then let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. 
Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And may the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy, and in our song we will praise our God. So can I invite you to stand with me? Uh, as, um, as I'm sure you're all getting used to now, we are um, unable to sing in the building still. But um, I wanted to just lead us in this, this song. It's an, it's an old hymn of the church, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. And, um, and I invite you to um, use, these, use these words as a, as a prayer to worship yourself. You can speak them out if you know them, if you remember them. Um, or just allow it, the words to wash over you, to reflect on the rock of ages, Jesus Christ, who was broken for each one of us. Let's worship together. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power, not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? These for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring, safely to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Saviour, or I die. While I draw this fleeting breath, when mine eyes shall close in death, when I soar through tracts unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne. Rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Yes, Lord Jesus, let us hide ourselves in you. The rock of ages broken for us, blood poured out to wash us clean. Let us hide ourselves in you. Amen. Amen. Please you take a seat. So as we rejoice in the gift of this day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. 
Amen. So we come to our scripture reading. This is John chapter 13. And starting at verse 21. Jesus, troubled in spirit, testified to them, Very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, ask him which one he means. So leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. And then, dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as, Jesus, as, soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. As I was saying, I think uh, certainly I have often um, struggled to know what to do with the story of Judas, the disciple who betrayed Jesus. I've struggled sometimes to, to see how, uh, how we can respond with our lives to this story, this difficult story of the disciple, a disciple who was so close to Jesus within the 12, had spent so much time with Jesus and yet could turn away and reject him. But I think uh, really there's just one, one thing I want to focus on this morning, um, this afternoon, uh, from this passage. And it's, it's this, I think, the fundamental truth that's comes to us through this passage is this, that Jesus is Lord even over the darkness. Jesus is Lord even over the darkness. You see, I think as I've been reading it and praying over it this week, the thing that struck me time and again that comes out of this passage is the assurance that Jesus remains the Lord even over the darkness of evil, he can turn what the enemy and the world meant for evil and work it for his purposes. Do we know, don't we, don't we, that there is a spiritual battle? There is evil in this world. And perhaps you, like me, have sometimes found yourself wrestling with that fact that there is very present evil in our world that seems to run riot at times. But Jesus remains the Lord of all things. You see, even in this most devastating betrayal of Jesus, the rejection of him by one of his closest friends, it's not only turned for God's purposes but it's predicted in scripture. A little earlier to our passage, Jesus quotes from Psalm 41, where it says, he who shared my bread has turned against me. You see, it wasn't even just that the circumstances of Jesus' betrayal were used by Jesus, by God, for the purpose of bringing about the cross, the sacrifice that would redeem us. 
restore the possibility of a relationship with God. But it had been predicted centuries beforehand that this is the way it would happen. You see, Jesus warns his disciples that someone is going to betray him so that they will realize, eventually, that although the whole that whole, uh, those whole sort of three days running up and through Jesus' arrest, crucifixion, and then finally to his glorious resurrection. Although that felt chaotic and like everything was falling apart, Jesus never lost control. He gave away his life, we read in scripture. He gave his life. It was not taken from him. He gave it willingly for us, for you, and for me. So Jesus wants to assure his disciples, though they don't yet understand it, he is still Lord. He is still in control. God is still sovereign and seated on the throne. And John wrote it down for us so that we might share in that assurance too. See, we see here, side by side, two opposite extremes in the life of Jesus. We have the disciple whom Jesus loved. We have this picture of of them seated so close to one another, actually reclining. This was the culture at the time of a a special meal. You would lie down uh, three to a couch and the disciple whom Jesus loved is, is close enough to Jesus that he can lean over his shoulder and rest himself on Jesus' chest. It's an incredible picture of intimacy, of closeness, of friendship. But on the other side, Jesus is flanked by his betrayer. And perhaps I think in, in one sense perhaps it's it's always a little bit like this in the christian life there's perhaps love and betrayal there's joy and agony there's breakthrough and setback there's affirmation and rejection that's certainly i think how i've experienced the christian walk there is both if you like battle and blessing i remember hearing Someone once say that um, they had once thought that battle and blessing in the Christian life was um, a sequence that you would go through battle and then you would hit the blessing and then you would go through some more battle and then you would hit the next blessing and you would go on like that. And as he looked back on his life, he said, no, actually, I don't think that's how it is. He said, it's almost like two railway tracks. They run in parallel. There's battle and blessing all the time, battle and blessing, battle and blessing in all the circumstances of our lives, in one area we might have a battle, but in another area there's blessing. There's God's blessing on us. You know, I think it's, it's worth us remembering as we reflect on this story that um, the, the disciples are deeply shocked by this revelation of Jesus, that someone would betray him. And that not just someone would betray him, but one of them See, they can't have helped but go through the the years of Jesus' ministry together as a group and and not built some sense of of deep friendship, of deep commitment to this, this cause, this radical cause of Jesus. And felt this sense of, of bonding, of of being really close to one another. And yet Jesus says, One of you will betray me. Often when we see pictures of um, the Last Supper, uh, where this moment takes place, uh, it's made very obvious who Judas is. He's usually the person who's lowest down in the picture, or is the most in shadow to make it, you know, to to represent the darkness taking over his heart, or um, any number of other um, symbols and imagery is used. Perhaps it's the look on the face. Everyone else looks shocked and but he looks angry or suspicious. There are any number of ways that artists or or, um, uh, illustrators have used to to show us who Judas is. And it seems very obvious, but the disciples didn't 
know. They couldn't tell. To them, Judas was, was just one of them, as far as they knew, equally committed, equally devoted to Jesus. You know, Jesus washed Judas's feet. Do you ever think about that? Jesus, when he washed the disciples' feet, he washed Judas's feet knowing that Judas was going to betray him. What an incredible act of love and humility and service to stoop in front of the person that you know is going to betray you and wash their feet. I think that's an incredibly powerful, beautiful picture of Jesus. And that gift that he gives him, this little, the dipping of the bread, it's not a um, it's not just a way of, of Jesus sort of surreptitiously showing John, uh, the disciple who Jesus loved, who the one. It's not, it's not just a sign between them. Um, this, this giving of, of a, a morsel, if you like, of a, of a tidbit by the host of a, a significant meal was an incredible honor in that culture. For, for Jesus to take some bread dip it and give it to Judas would have been a sign to the disciples that Judas was particularly favored at that meal. It was like lifting him up before the whole group and singling him out for, for, for praise, for affirmation. It, it, It was full of symbolism, this moment, where Jesus was lifting him up and giving him an incredible place of honor in the group. And that sort of reveals the depth, really, of of the betrayal of Judas to Jesus. That even in this moment of incredible, this this relationship they had of deep trust. You know, I think sometimes I've been tempted to think of Judas as probably being one of the outliers of the twelve. You know, that that friend who didn't quite always feel like he fitted in or was sort of always a bit on the edge, not quite sure, questioning. But I'm not sure whether that's true, actually. I've been really challenged to think maybe actually Judas had seemed really on board the whole way. Maybe there had even been a time where he was and, and was deeply involved and committed. And, and yet there was something, there was a root of something in his heart. Where it had come from, we don't know. We're never told. But it didn't seem odd necessarily to anyone, that Judas was being treated with this kind of honor. I find that interesting, almost startling. And this is another incredible picture of Jesus confronting his betrayer, not with anger, not with disappointment, not with disapproval or scorn or ridicule, not with words of condemnation, but with one final astonishing act of generosity and love, reaching out to him. I like to imagine trying to offer him one last chance not to follow through, not to go ahead and do it, to allow it to be somebody else. But tragically, we witness that it is possible to resist even the prolonged, persistent petitions of Jesus himself. And Judas takes the bread and commits in his heart to do the thing that he had planned to do. And so Jesus tells him to do it. Jesus allows him the freedom to make his choice. Even though it affects him deeply, Jesus is troubled John tells us that Jesus was deeply troubled in spirit at this knowledge, this truth that Judas would betray him. It must have hurt him to see Judas commit to this self-destructive act, this course of action. 
But I think also Jesus was troubled, as he, we've seen elsewhere in the Gospels. He was troubled at the way that sin dominates and desecrates and enslaves people's lives. And so for us too, I believe we're called to confront, to wrestle with, to grieve at the impact and power of sin in our world, in our communities, in our families. Like Jesus, we should be troubled by the destructive impact of sin. And just one final thought, just 24 hours on from this, this scene that we've heard read. Judas will have betrayed Jesus. He will have handed him over to the authorities. And he will realize the terrible and irreversible thing that he has done. And he will take his own life. In my... Um, in my prayer times this week, uh, I, I follow along with a, a set of prayer notes. And, um, and I was really struck by this question that they asked. They asked, what would have happened if Judas hadn't killed himself? If he had held on long enough to encounter the risen Jesus and receive forgiveness? They said, would he have not had the most powerful testimony of all the disciples that would have spoken to countless people through the ages who considered their sins too great for the grace of God. So I think one of the things we're confronted with in Judas is the lie that there are sins that are too great, there are deeds that cannot be uh, covered by the grace of God. That no matter what we have said, thought, done, we know, having seen in Jesus, in the resurrection of Jesus, that there is nothing, no matter how wrong our lives have gone, no matter how many mistakes we think we've made, no matter how hopeless the situation feels or seems, it's never too late for God. No sin is too great for his love. our sin and the enemy who accuses us and the world even tells us that there are things that you cannot come back from but Jesus says that's not true so just as I close I guess the message for us today is that if Jesus could harness and use the, the dark forces of evil at work on that Good Friday, in fact, Maundy Thursday and Good Friday. Use them for his purpose of walking to the cross to willingly give up his life for you and for me. Then he can and will master the darkness and sin that confronts us too. In giving our lives to him, we don't need to exclude the darkness of our own past, our current sinfulness, or our future fears. He is the Lord over it all. I think we can take perhaps what may feel like strange comfort from Jesus in this passage, from his words to the disciples. It's assurance that he is not out of control. That even the purposes of evil are held firmly within the overarching purposes of God's love and liberation for all people. Jesus, through his death and resurrection, has conquered sin and death. He is the light that shines in the darkness and that has never and will never be overcome. Let's just take a moment of quiet to reflect for ourselves on what God is saying 
to you, to me. And so gathering our prayers and praises into one. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray for the help of the Holy Spirit as we seek to walk as followers of Jesus. So be with us, Spirit of God. Nothing can separate us from your love. Breathe on us, breath of God. Fill us with your saving and sanctifying power. Speak to us, wisdom of God. Bring strength, healing, and peace. Come upon us, fire from heaven. Send us out with love and courage. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. We proclaim not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for his sake. And so as we draw our service to a close, Christ crucified draw you to himself to find in him a sure ground for faith a firm support for hope and the assurance of sins forgiven and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen. Once we were far off, but now in union with Jesus, we have been brought near through the shedding of his blood for he is our peace. So may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Thank you so much for joining with us and we look forward to seeing you again next week. <laughs>